So this next number always is staggering to me. Um, already $23 trillion has been allocated globally to investment strategies that fall under the term sustainable, responsible, and impact investment. $23 trillion, which is approximately one in two um, in Europe and one in five in the US. Institutional investors and millennials are pressing investment managers to consider things such as climate risk, resource constraints, gender equity, and rapid urbanization. This is leading the ESG growth to be far faster than that of mainstream investing. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Lenore Suki, who's the head of sustainable finance product strategy for Bloomberg's Sustainable Business and Finance Group. She manages projects in public and private equity, debt and real estate, as well as initiatives at the intersection of philanthropy and product strategy, such as green and social bonds, impact investment, and data science applications. She's going to first introduce us to the topic, and then we will have a panel that will look at some of Bloomberg's data and analytics in this space. We have a very esteemed group of colleagues, um, including Dr. Arun Verma, who's the head of Bloomberg's Quant Research Solutions Group here. Bobby Shackleton, who's the man uh, or the person uh, <laughs> when it comes to all things mapping related at Bloomberg. And he's also an at-large board member of the New York Map Society. And then Madison England, who's our project manager for the Bloomberg Gender Equality Index, also known as GEI. She's been part of Bloomberg's ESG efforts since 2013. So come on up here, Lenore, and get us started. Hi there. Good afternoon, everyone. Is this, um, does this working? That sounds like, OK, great. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Karen mentioned, um, I work in our sustainable business and finance group. And what I have done primarily in the five and change years that I've been at Bloomberg is work with investment managers, uh, as well as a number of other different kinds of institutions who are interested in integrating themes around environmental, social, and governance issues into their investment process. Um, first of all, to manage risk. Second of all, to identify opportunities associated with um, large-scale global challenges and, and paradigm shifts in the global economy. And third, to um, identify ways of having a greater impact on societies and on the environment through the capital that they are investing and allocating. Um, so let me, um, oh, is someone else doing that for me? <laughs> OK, great, fantastic. All right, so maybe next slide, please. So what I'm going to do is give you a very quick whirlwind tour of what this space looks like. We're going to talk first about the rising tide of sustainable investing. Karen referred to a few of the numbers. Um, and then we're going to talk about what the data landscape looks like very quickly. And then I'm going to give just a few examples of how um, organizations are really innovating around data to um, you know, innovate in the financial markets and achieve positive social and environmental impact through the capital markets and investment. Um, so as Karen mentioned, the, uh, the assets under management that are now dedicated to sustainable investing strategies have grown very rapidly. I think across the board we're seeing, you know, double digit growth across all categories. Um, this, uh, this graph represents assets that are represented by signatories to the Principles for Responsible Investment, which is like a global umbrella organization that has um, five principles that are associated with how investment managers should be thinking about environmental, social, and governance issues in the context of the investment decision-making process. Um, right now, uh, the universe of signatories is um, at 2,000 signatories globally um, with about $80 trillion in assets under management represented. Now, that doesn't mean $80 trillion in assets that are managed to these strategies yet, but $80 trillion that's represented by the organizations who have signed up. If you look at the actual amount of 
uh, assets that have been um, dedicated to this strategy. Right now, globally, it is something in the range of, uh, of $20 trillion. Um, this just maps some data that um, Bloomberg has researched uh, in Bloomberg Intelligence, um, showing in particular that there has been a big uptick in the last couple of years in funds. So those are investable strategies that any of us could invest our money in. Um, as well as the assets under management in those funds. So right now we're at about $450 billion in dedicated funds that have explicit strategies. So let's say anything from a strategy that just says sustainability leaders very generally, or a strategy that is focused on a specific theme. Maybe it's gender, maybe it's water, or other kind of low carbon economy transition themes. So the space is growing very rapidly. If you looked at a graph of ETFs, it is even more dramatic. The space is growing very rapidly at all levels, institutional investors and retail investors alike. The thing to understand about this, although I just mentioned ETFs, is that these are actively managed strategies. So this is where your portfolio manager is sitting in a room and saying with an analyst who understands these topics and trying to marry the process of understanding these ESG risks and opportunities with traditional conventional financial analysis. And they're, so they're using it as a way of either responding to asset owners like pension funds who, for instance, don't want tobacco in their portfolio or they don't want alcohol in their portfolio. So that's one kind, and, or they may be actually using this information to enhance the investment decision-making process. For instance, to say, utilities that use coal may be highly exposed in a world where there's carbon pricing or where consumers simply start to move towards cleaner sources of energy. So the space is growing very rapidly. It's mostly active managers. The reason why this is happening is not just because big pension funds like you know, California, uh, California's public pension funds or New York public pension funds, uh, as well as the European public pension funds, they have all been pushing it. But another reason why this is growing is that there is actually increasing evidence that shows that companies that manage their environmental, social, and governance risks and their operations in a sustainable fashion actually perform better, while those that have red flags, and that those could be red flags around, as I mentioned, coal, or it could be around um, uh, uh, poor human resource or human capital management. Um, I think we've all seen, you know, for instance, what the Me Too movement has done in the entertainment and other industries, for instance. So across environmental, social, and governance issues, and both, um, a number of studies have shown that there are uh, there are real differences between how companies actually perform, not just in terms of their financial performance, their stock market performance, but also their return on assets, their return on investment, um, their earnings quality. Um, and so this is just, this is a Deutsche Bank um, study that has been done that basically just shows some of the differentials um, across regions um, and across analyses that are just environmental, social, and governance or com combinations. Um, and this is just part of a growing body of work that shows um, uh, positive performance uh, from good performance. And I think Arun is going to speak to some of those uh, in his presentation. So how, do, how does all this happen? I mean, that's really sort of been what our business is. How do we help investment managers and pension funds and foundations, et cetera, um, invest their capital more sustainably? So I think the first thing to understand is that there are lots of different ways of doing this. Um, there are a number of different strategies, and I'm not going to go into them in detail because we don't have a lot of time, but um, just so that you understand a little bit about the landscape, the three most important strategies are those that exclude stocks or exclude companies or securities from a portfolio, those that aim to integrate completely into the investment decision-making process or to say we are going to look for the best actors in a particular universe of, of investable vehicles, or those that may, on top of this, engage with companies through proxy voting, um, through shareholder proposals where they are having um, regular one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes conversations with companies about their environmental, social, and governance practices. Um, and these are the top three. So each of these in themselves have certain sort of demands from a data perspective. 
Um, these last two are very small but growing very quickly. So this is sustainability themed investing. So as I mentioned, there may be a specific theme like the transition to a low carbon economy um, uh, or gender, for instance. So there are a number of vehicles that are emerging in that space. Um, or impact investing, which is often in private markets, but also now increasingly in public markets, where the idea is to identify a specific issue and achieve, attempt to achieve quantifiable social and environmental impact directly through the allocation of capital. So that might be in an affordable house, you know, capital directed to an affordable housing uh, company um, or developer. Um, so, or to, let's say, solar lamps in Africa. So all of these um, have their own very specific kind of data needs. Um, and that's, that's what we have been trying to respond to at Bloomberg. And all of this is being driven um, by emerging changes in the global landscape. So, so these drivers, these global drivers, are also essentially driving what kind of data is needed. Um, the most important drivers are around intangible value, the regulatory exposure of companies, um, global risks and opportunities that are emerging, and increasing transparency across the financial and capital markets. Um, the intangible value one is very interesting because it, it, it underlines that the very nature of data in the capital markets and how investors are using information has changed very dramatically. From a world where financial information was heterogeneous and where analysts could essentially sort of through their you know, stock picking and through conventional financial analysis identify sources of value. As financial information is becoming increasingly commoditized, um, the information that analysts are now increasingly looking for is information that drives the intangible value of companies. So their reputational assets, goodwill, et cetera. Um, and there is a lot that focuses on in, uh, intangible value in sustainability analysis. The other thing that I think everyone would probably be aware of, especially now if you look at the news with the typhoon in Asia and um, uh, Hurricane Florence, is you know, these global risks and opportunities like climate change. I mean, climate change is arguably the most urgent, pressing challenge that investors currently face for a number of different reasons. But so climate change is another, another driver, as is urbanization, cybercrime, water crises. You all just saw the video on the California water crisis. Um, many of these risks and opportunities are driving regulatory exposure, so carbon pricing, the Clean, uh, Clean Air Act, um, all of these, or also um, transparency laws um, in different regions that require companies to disclose environmental, social, and governance information. And likewise, increasingly tra increasing transparency. So I'm sure that you have seen others talking about news, for instance. I mean, the 24-hour news cycle plus social media, this is requiring companies to be more transparent about both the positive and the negative, as well as these intangible and extra financial factors. So just to give you a sense of how all of that essentially funnels into what kind of data um, organizations, investment managers need in order to make these decisions. Um, right now, this is what the data landscape looks like. Um, there are survey-driven um, types of data, um, and uh, Madison will speak to you all about the gender equality index, which is largely driven by surveys that go to companies. There's primary data, which is what drives the Bloomberg uh, platform. So that's data that companies are reporting publicly or semi-publicly. Um, and then there's increasingly alternative data, uh, which is seeking to identify information from non-traditional sources that focus very specifically on environmental and social issues. These are mostly driven by analysts. Um, and by a lot of sort of subjective and in many cases non-transparent forms of analysis. And the output is often scores, um, estimates, so estimates for carbon or estimates for the amount of revenue exposure a company may have to a certain sector like tobacco, for instance. Um, some of these produce alerts on company, like controversy alert, um, and others sort of go all the way from this you know, company sort of aggregation process and analysis process to produce indexes or lists of companies. 
this is where the vast majority of the activity in our space is. Um, and these are a number of different for-profit and non-profit organizations that are producing these scores and indices. Um, Bloomberg has really banked its product on, um, on, uh, on company data. So we'll show you a screen of company data. The challenge with company data is gaps in the information and non-comparable um, heterogeneous ways of reporting data. And on the alternative data, the challenge is that although we may be able to pick up interesting information about for deforestation, for instance, somebody still has to analyze that into some kind of conclusion. So how are we seeing data being leveraged for good in the capital markets? Um, so one of the things, and Bobby is going to speak to this more, is we're seeing more interest in using asset level information with alternative data sets. So where are all the power plants, which are highly water intensive, where are they located relative to water stress? So this is one kind of example, asset level information and aggregating that information, for instance, into much more geographically specific carbon emissions data, for instance, which tells you more about the company's exposure. Or using supply chain information to understand how companies are integrating environmental and social management practices throughout their supply chain globally. Um, so these are two different kinds of analyses um, that we are seeing uh, our clients use. There is also a lot of interest in trying to increase the frequency of insights about environmental and social information from news and other kinds of unstructured data. So for instance, Bloomberg has sentiment analysis. There are, there are a number of products out there now that are seeking to move from annual data, annual carbon data, annual human resources data to, um, in some cases, intraday or daily information about companies' reputational assets, for instance. Um, finally, I think it's really important to understand that kind of the next wave of capital for good is going to have to do with aggregating very small data um, for capital markets. So, for instance, just as an example, you know, Bloomberg tags green bonds. So these are bonds that have been raised for specific environmental activities. Some of these are green bonds that are backed by very small transactions. So households buying solar panels, for instance, or households buying, getting a mortgage for an energy efficient home. And these, the, the applications for this are really huge. And you will, you will hear in the market organizations talking about IoT and a way of using sensors to essentially you know, meter energy efficiency or water efficiency, for instance, and then aggregate that information into performance linked security that are then you know, purchasable by you know, investors like us, for instance. So this is going to be one of the next waves of how the capital markets leverage finance and data for good. I think that might be my last slide, actually. OK, yes, so that's my last slide. So that gives you a very, very quick overview of the space. And I'm very happy to, you know, we, I think, I hope we'll have a little bit of time for questions, but obviously happy to talk about the space um, after my colleagues speak. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Thanks Arun. I'm going to try to use the clicker here. All right, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm from the quantitative research team at Bloomberg. And I guess the underlying theme for my talk is really about responsible investing needs responsible data science. So as, as we all know, um, you know in, in the, in, as Lenar mentioned, um, there's a big growth in the passive investing uh, uh, sort of field where we are going away from sort of more fundamental uh, bottom-up approach of, of understanding companies and, and sector information, but really going after sort of more data-driven and quantitative approaches where we are sort of looking at factors which drive the markets at a, at a very sort of a high level across a large number of names. And um, in, in that particular context, we are sort of employing a very heavy machine learning um, methods and employing a large amount of multidimensional data. And so I'll, I'll talk about how we use that for ESG, but also some caveats around how to use it more responsibly as well. Um, so you know, we know that uh, you know, both, both these trends, you know, machine learning, big data, and ESG are, are really huge right now. Um, you know, there's um, machine learning being used uh, in all aspects of, of um, data, data generation and analysis as well. So for example, in the factor discovery phase, or information extraction phase, 
we are using uh, NLP and um, image, image analysis to sort of build factors from raw information. So for example, um, company disclosure information that comes through filing, filings like 10K filings are being uh, extracted using uh, NLP methods. Um, you know, Lenora mentioned um, using sentiment analysis uh, among, among the news items which specifically mentioned the theme of uh, ESG uh, or, or sustainable finance. Um, it's very important to build the right information to begin with. Um, and then going forward to sort of more, um, uh, more advanced use cases around looking at satellite imagery, um, you know, looking at what kind of trucks are entering production facilities uh, using those image data. Um, also analysis of any sort of um, uh, uh, calls from the C-suite, you know, maybe earnings calls where these executives are mentioning their um, sort of um, uh, information about ESG and, and those metrics in particular. So, so that's at the, at the discovery level, but then when, once we have discovered the information from, uh, for these types of factors, how do we sort of build, um, you know, actually investing ideas from those factors? So first of all, we'll, we'll note that um, not all companies are even reporting on these metrics. So there's a lot of missing data, and that's where is, uh, we have another sort of uh, opportunity to use sort of more heavy data science and machine learning to, uh, to impute uh, missing information or non-reported information, as well as looking for any uh, anomaly detection among those data sets. Um, and, f and finally, when we build these uh, f uh, factors to sort of study them across a large number of companies, we need to normalize these factors. So they are, they are, um, you know, they are sort of, uh, you know, they are on the same level playing field across the different companies and different sectors. Um, so there's a lot of feature engineering that goes in to go from the raw, raw extracted information into what's really useful for investing. And I'll speak about that later in my presentation. And, and then later, really for portfolio construction use case, um, there's a lot of work that's being done to build uh, multi-factor portfolios. So here we are actually blending ESG factors along with sort of the traditionally known um, risk premium factors. So really sort of figure out what is the blend that we need between ESG and traditional sort of value or, or market factors. Um, so a word about big data, again, I think this is timely because uh, we had this great announcement by Foursquare this morning. Um, so Foursquare, as you, as you all know, carries a large amount of data. Um, so this chart shows you uh, the dip they had from, you know, 1415 to 1516 in their um, um, tracking of, of foot traffic uh, for Chipotle, right? So um, we know that in 15, 2015, we had um, news about um, um, you know, E. coli virus outbreak, which really led to um, a large decline in the foot traffic. Um, and then you know, there was further concerns later on as we, there was reports of people getting sick um, by uh, after eating at Chipotle, um, that's sort of middle of the year, and then later in the in the year we had um, Chipotle sort of offering um, some uh, some rain check burritos or free burritos, and you can you can clearly see the the gray shadow there sort of upticks heavily at that point. So so clearly a lot of information in this data, and we are tracking it from all kind of non-traditional and alternative data sources. It's all pretty exciting, but at the same time, uh, we have this kind of ish problems if you use um, a large amount of data um, and do sort of simple analysis. So this chart shows you that if you, if you, if you look at uh, the per capita cheese consumption and number of people who died by becoming tangled in the bed sheets, it's heavily correlated, right? <laughs> and this is purely, it's just, it's purely because we are looking at a uh, um, huge amount of information and mining uh, uh, or, s or snooping there to sort of figure out uh, correlations. If you're looking at like thousands of underlying time series, you're essentially looking at a millions, million, of, million of pairs. And obviously there's a big statistical chance that uh, you will find a lot of pairs among the million that will have this kind of correlation. So once you are looking into sort of big data to, to extract any inf information, you have to you have to actually build a better science around it. So as an ESG, uh, ESG case, we are you know, contrasting our sort of quantitative factor generation 
with uh, research on good governance practices. So we really sort of filter down and, and include uh, subjective and intuition um, in addition to sort of pure data-driven methods. So just to highlight quickly, we don't have much time to uh, hear, but um, um, you know, a couple of factors that we are looking at are around board diversity and independence. So this is like so Bloomberg data for good um, um, in the ESG space. So you know, things like number of women directors for every company or, or the age range. Um, and in the independence, whether the CEO is on the board or CEO is same as the chairman, these factors do have uh, and uh, potential predictive uh, ability to, to, to say something about the future performance of a company. And the data indeed shows a very good trend. We see that the uh, number of uh, board members that are women um, as a percentage are have almost doubled in, in 10 years from about 11, 12% to about 20%. Same with a number of companies um, which have, uh, you know, CEO is same as chairman is actually declining because that's actually considered sometimes a negative factor. Uh, we see that number of companies have, have gone down substantially. And once, once we have collected all this data, we need to actually sort of build the, um, the factors for investing, and that's where we use feature engineering. So this is the example for board age range, and on the left is what we call a quantile plot where we look at the board age range factor across a large number of companies, Russell 2000 or 1000, and we essentially build 10 different buckets from it. And uh, for each of those buckets, we look at the return of the, on, the, on the common equity for the next month. Um, and we, look, we plot the average returns and the 95% uh, confidence intervals around, around that average. And you see that um, for the, for the with well, the extreme left, which is the lowest age range, we have a uh, negative return. It's, it's sort of uh, substantially below the zero line, and all the other uh, returns are sort of you know, flat or sort of a bit noisy around the zero line. So um, a traditional factor that's used is sort of a, you know, a linear factor in the linear factor model uh, framework. But here, essentially, we do, we do notice that we can build a better engineered factor, which is simply binary where we isolate the, 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 the first decile and, and combine all the rest of them into sort of one category, and we come up with um, you know, um, this two sort of a binary factor uh, model. Um, and it's also sort of ties with the intuition. It's essentially this cutoff happens to be exactly around 12 years of the age range. So the entire age range of the board is 12 years. It's kind of like within one generation. All the, all the people on the board are within one generation. That tends to be some, somewhat, somewhat bad. Uh, if there's more diversity, the people from different generation in the board is usually good for the, good for the company's performance. Um, so now tying that into, into sort of more general way of thinking about factor investing, um, um, you, know, you know, I won't call myself a quant if I don't have a, a, a mathematical formula, so here it is. So this is a, a, an extension of the, or the simple sort of initially what was called the CAPM uh, market model by William Sharp of the Sharp Ratio fame. He actually won a Nobel Prize for this work, um, extended to multiple factors. So we have the return of any, uh, any company or stock uh, decomposed as a, a stock specific alpha, which is like an excess return over, over, um, over, the, over the other factors, uh, plus all the contributions from the various factors uh, so betas are the exposures to the factors, and the Fs are the, the returns of those factor, factors themselves, plus an idiosyncratic noise, which is, which is varying period to period. Now, this picture is very, very uh, telling. Um, we like to divide up the factors into these four quadrants. Um, on, on the top left is uh, what we call risk premium factors or price factors, where these factors are actually driving uh, cross-sectional returns of, this, of, of the big sort of market, uh, many different stocks, um, but also earn you some uh, premium. Uh, so these are, these are factors which, which have explained the risk in the stocks, but also get you some return. On the bottom left, we have um, uh, non-price factors or pure risk factors. So these factors uh, do explain a large amount of cross-sectional co-movement of stocks, but don't actually give you an additional return. 
So things like uh, you know industry uh, membership, right? So obviously, if you have many stocks in the same industry, they will have this underlying factor, which is sort of will make them co-move and explain a lot of cross-sectional risk. But just the fact that you belong in the same industry does not get you any premium. So these these factors are are, are have no return. But where it gets very interesting is um, is on the on the right hand side where we have um, what we call alpha factors or spurious noise sort of uh, in, in those two areas. And it actually gets very difficult to distinguish between the two. You know, what, um, what we call alpha factor is essentially um, you know, trying to extract that alpha term by combining long short combinations of different stocks and canceling out all the beta exposures. Uh, so once you cancel out all the beta, you have left with the alpha, but you also have the epsilon term, which is the noise term. And that's where we're talking about at the, at the bottom right. So it's difficult to sort of tell where it's coming from, whether it's really alpha or is it noise. So um, we think that a lot of new alternative data sources um, you know, uh, have potentially alpha signal, like news, news sentiment, for example. But you can also construct any kind of factor you want. So I mentioned here, for example, looking at you know, two sets of companies, one set of companies which start with the first 13 letters of the alphabet as their name versus the companies which start at the bottom half of the alphabet. And you can compare the performance of this, these two different buckets. And maybe you'll get lucky. Maybe if you look at a certain period, you might have uh, some performance. And you might think it's, it's potentially is a, it's a factor which has alpha. But clearly, there's no sort of financial intuition behind it. So this, that, that one is probably spurious noise. So, so that's where we need sort of more robust data science to really tell us where we are in that spectrum. And that's the kind of work we are doing with ESG. Um, um, in, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll probably skip uh, very quickly through this. So you know, I talked about the discovery, scoring, and optimization. All of these phases require um, um, very uh, you know, heavily quantitative um, analysis as well as machine learning. Um, um, what I'll, what I'll uh, show you is like a quick um, snapshot of what kind of results we are finding. So this is a dashboard uh, which shows you um, blending of different factors uh, uh, from, the, from the ESG. So we have like board age range and tenure and so on on the, on the top right, on the, on the right hand side. And on the bottom left here is what we call a risk reward frontier or risk return efficient frontier. And um, the companies which are sort of on the top envelope are, are, are called efficient, com efficient portfolios. Uh, those are actually portfolios of the different factors. And I've highlighted one of the, one of the most efficient uh, parts of the portfolio here uh, with the white dot. And um, that white dot is corresponds to the performance on the, on the, on the top, top left and sh clearly shows you that you get a, a good amount of return, but also very low volatility. So you know you see it has very little little sort of drawdowns or big movements. So you know all the ESG factors have some sort of risk premium, but you can further combine them to achieve a better risk-adjusted return. Um, and you can see you know, blends that are, that that sort of um, uh, achieve that efficiency. Um, and this this picture actually combines the ESG data with also the traditional risk premium or market factors. So we are looking at you know, book to price, which is also known as the value factor uh, or the size factor. Um, and again, we look at one of the efficient portfolios um, at, the, at, the, at the top here, which has a very good return and very low volatility. And see that if you look at the, um, the makeup of that portfolio, you'll see it is actually drawing from not just the traditional factors, but also a lot from the ESG factors. So clearly, ESG has a marginal uh, additional value in providing the premium um, return uh, with, with very, very low contribution to the risk. So with that, I'll hand it over to Madison. Thank you very much. Great. So 
Transitioning to gender equality in particular as part of the sustainable finance discussion, um, the, the gender equality index was really founded on the premise of data for social good. Um, so our belief is really that data transparency leads to measuring uh, factors that have an impact underlying, you know, figuring out the underlying causes of some of these issues and really ensuring accountability for company progress uh, over time. So at Bloomberg, I think we're uniquely positioned as a link between companies that are reporting this data and investors that are increasingly looking for it as some of the trend data that Lenora had showed. Um, so over the past 10 years, we've really seen that environmental and governance data um, is being reported in a, in a bit more of a standardized way. We're able to find it a little bit easier in filings, a little bit more standardized. Um, but when it comes to the social and the gender data in particular, we're still seeing sort of a, a lack of standardized and comparable data. So that's really what gave rise to the birth of the, the Gender Equality Index in 2016. So um, to talk a little bit about the metrics that we're measuring as it comes to gender equality. So we've taken what we feel is a, a holistic look at the gender equality uh, health of a company across these four different areas. So when we talk about gender statistics, um, we're talking about everything from the pipeline of women uh, coming through the workforce and, and being able to climb up the corporate ladder to equal pay to tenure and attrition. Uh, when we talk about company pil policies, we're looking at um, you know, paid parental leave, for example, or career development programs. And then we start to look a little bit external from the company's own workforce and look at community engagement. So is the company supporting nonprofits that are working for gender equality or lobbying for legislation, for example? And then the product offerings. So does the company provide uh, products for women's health? Are they conscious of uh, biases in their ads and their marketing campaigns? And all companies that meet uh, a score threshold that we've determined that's based largely on disclosure and a bit of a best in class element are selected for the index on an annual basis. I keep going the wrong way. Um, so the 2018 index uh, is comprised of over 100 companies across all sectors and it's global. So it represents uh, countries, uh, companies headquartered in 24 countries and regions around the world. Um, so here on this, on this graph, we've just figured out uh, a few of these key attributes from each of the regions that we've seen to be uh, differentiating. So in the Americas, 80% of the GEI members offer elder care support. And we've seen that uh, you know, the responsibility of caring for elders tends to fall on the women in the family. So having that benefit is really helpful. In Europe, for example, we're seeing that 74% of our GEI members conduct uh, pay gap compensation reviews. Um, and 32% of them are disclosing their pay gap uh, statistics and filings. And that's much higher than we've seen in Americas and in, in the Asia Pacific region. And then in Asia, 84% uh, of our GEI members provide return to work programs. And they also offer flexible uh, work schedules for employees. So when we look at the data that we've collected through the GEI, as I mentioned, um, we're seeing this pipeline issue. And it's really industry agnostic. It's company agnostic. It's really a, a pervasive problem that I think we're all pretty aware of. Um, but what we've seen from our GEI member firms is that roughly half of the women um, are represented in the workforce and they're earning 46% of the promotions, which is a, a great sign. But then we see as we climb up the ladder um, to senior leadership, it represents only 20, 26% are, are made up of women and then executive officers, it falls to 19%. So some of these statistics are really hard to budge. Um, so what we've tried to do is really analyze the gender gap and see what some of those underlying issues are that really are, you know, if, if we can fix them, we'll help to, to fix those, those numbers. Um, so I mentioned pipeline and development. We're looking at unconscious bias, uh, mentoring programs, um, policies that some companies have for uh, gender diverse slates of management roles. So you at least have one woman candidate uh, for these management roles. Um, so, but there are really great things that a lot of the companies are doing that are GEI members and more broadly. Um, so I mentioned parental leave, paid maternity and paternity leave, which is not a given in the United States, for example, as we all know. Um, healthcare services, gender reassignment for colleagues that are transitioning in the workplace. We're seeing that pick up a bit. Um, and then some of the, the marketing and advertising content that I mentioned before. So for us, I think the real driver is that this data is now on the terminal. It's, it's on the desks of investment professionals that are able to use it and integrate it. Um, and these, this basket of over 100 companies has really demonstrated their commitment to disclosure and to progress as a result. 
Um, so really, the, from a data perspective, um, the ability to really synthesize and standardize this information and get it up onto the terminal is, I think, a powerful thing. And it's not easy to do. Um, so I wanted to kind of highlight a few uh, challenges that we've faced in this process. So as Lenora mentioned, the Gender Equality Index is a survey-based uh, approach to collecting data, which, which is, is good on one hand because you have that direct engagement with the companies. You're able to provide them with a framework of, of exactly what to measure and how to measure it. Um, but on the flip side, it can be really difficult to manage and scale that more broadly to a large pool of companies. Um, getting consensus on the metrics. I mean, there are tons of data points that you can collect related to everything under the sun. Um, and getting consensus on which ones are the, the right questions to be asking is something that we've tried really uh, hard to do, and I think we could do more. Um, and also, just from a reporting perspective, we've taken a really global lens to collecting this data, whereas um, you know, rather than just looking at a company's headquarters and what do they provide for those employees, you know, if you're operating in 100 countries, there are employees in those satellite offices that don't have access to the same benefits. So really taking a global lens has been, I think, good, but it's also challenging for companies as well to really aggregate that data across their HR systems. Um, so these are the over 100 companies that you can take a look at. Um, and I think as Lenora showed, we've seen a, a huge growth in the indices and the ratings space. And I think that it really does help to push for transparency and progress. The more that we can sort of surface this data and bring it to light, the more accountable companies are to improving. Um, so we're looking forward to launching our 2019 index in January. And I look forward to any questions you may have at the end. Thanks a lot. Hi, everybody. Thank you. So I'm standing between uh, lunch and this presentation, so I'll be quick. It's lots of pictures, though. I am the map person here. So pull out your camera, uh, tweet, uh, post social as you will. I am very honored, frankly, to work for Bloomberg. A big reason why I work here is to do for good. We uh, contribute pretty much all of the money made at Bloomberg towards philanthropy. Um, a lot of the work that I get to do gets to expose the good things that we want to do for gender equality, coral reefs, sustainability, philanthropy, and so forth. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. It's more of an overview of what we've done to visualize and communicate uh, the initiatives that we've done visually. And I'll go into a case study of uh, something called TCFD, a climate-based reporting uh, call to action with Mike Bloomberg, the UN, and hundreds of companies in the world. So for maps, really three things uh, jump off. And I, real quick before I get started, I got to give a plug to my daughter. She's five, Aria. She's up here in the front <laughs> taking part. <laughs> Thank you, Aria. So the map really does three things. It generates an idea right at the beginning. You could say, wow, India is hot. United States is mixed. It exposes an insight, like I just mentioned. And then it can communicate a strategy at the very end. It can also deliver insights that are difficult to see, or with the technology in the back end, deliver insights faster than imaginable. So imagine a hurricane is going off, Florence, Harvey in this case. The moment that advisory updates will summarize the impact, turn into a news story, and then have a map that links back to it. And this is the sort of technology meets sustainability in ESG to, to provide disruption. But really, Something to really understand is a map goes well beyond a visualization. Behind every map visual that you see is a raw table of data. And that raw table of data can be used for data science, for screening and filtering and so forth. So understand that for any map that you see, there's data behind it and there's analysis that can go with it. So within the terminal, we have uh, 300 plus alternative geospatial data sets. And my call to action is to take this alt unique data, combine it with the primary company data, and create something new, unique, synthesized that no one else has. Here was an example where I did a, a query out of our system of pulling in um, several of the biggest companies in the world, color coded by how, uh, the percentage of women on their management board. The Magenta ones have more female employees in management. The, more, the cyan ones have less. And so you can start to see some trends geographically uh, within proximity. It's a good example of whether you want to do a reach out campaign or, or drive the conversation. This was a good visual for it. Another one that's dear to Mike Bloomberg's heart and philanthropy is coral reefs and, and the oceans. And so here we took uh, some weather data on the back end for heat. 
We've taken various coral reef diseased and bleached data sets, and we're able to visualize them. And so this, just on a map, can, you can quickly see the type of a disease in a certain area of the Persian Gulf, the, the dispersedness of you know, here around Belize, and so forth. But those are just a few quick examples. Where I want to spend a few minutes on is talking about this use case of TCFD, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Ah. But what this is is a voluntary program that companies around the world are starting to sign up for to, to report on an annual basis right now, like they do for other financials, what their exposure to the climate risk is in a forward-looking face uh, way. This allows them to strategize and plan for it and invest properly. Mike Bloomberg chairs this. To be clear, this is outside of Bloomberg LP. This is just one of those things that we do for good. There are, last I counted, close to 300 companies uh, that are, have already volunteered for this. I worked with the UN and 16 of uh, the biggest banks in the world to come up with a pilot uh, use case for analyzing physical risk. This has been published and documented. If you Google TCFD, or uh, navigating new climate, you will see this report. You can download it. It's a PDF, 71 pages long. You'll see 21 references of Bloomberg Maps, several maps published in there, and we're a part of this methodology going forward. And here's how it started. We took primary company data, like power plants around the world. We had ownership, fuel type, capacity, a few basic values. We then took alternative data, cyclone risk, fire risk, storm surge risks, et cetera, completely disparate. You can't join those in the traditional sense of data. But using spatial technology, we're able to merge those via the z-axis and attribute all the climate factors, dozens of new columns. Remember, a map and data. We've added dozens of new columns to that same power plant primary company data set. And now you can see your cyclone exposure at the physical risk level. So then what the UN and all the, the banks did they went through their portfolio of companies, filtered it down, got to their portfolio outlook, exported the data out, and they were able to summarize and aggregate that, and then look at a more macro level of what their impact and what their risk and exposure was. So here's an example of one of these tables. It's now humongous, 100 columns you know, wide, but it allows them to cross filter across different metrics. We also took in other data like production loss for transmission. These are just other examples of the way we were able to intersect this for hydropower, thermal power at 2020, 2040, at two degrees, at four degrees. So for various scenarios, you could get your analysis. And then you could put it all together inside a nice pretty picture because at the end you want to communicate the strategy. You want to tell them what you're talking about and a picture is worth a thousand words. And so now that's that uh, now merged data set, and on the underline showing the cyclone risk, so you can see the big picture of where it looks. Here was an example of this same analysis with excessive heat. I showed this at the beginning, but you can really see if you roll this up to a country level at a macro level, the United States might show a medium value, but really that's a false narrative when you have hot spots, you have cold spots. It's not you know, just one metric for one giant geography. This is where the micro level asset data really comes into play. Did the same thing with storm search as an example. And really that's it. I just want to give you guys a, a, a brief overview. And because it's Bloomberg and we work for Bloomberg, the last thing I want to leave you with is I want to switch it over to the terminal right now and show you one of our uh, most important features for the moment, this is Hurricane Go, or Map Hurricane. We track uh, the live storms from around the world. We have hurricanes today coming very soon as typhoons and the rest of the landscape. But what's interesting with this is it's more than a visual. You can go through and you can say, turn on your power plants um, across the entire world. And then you can, with a simple click, just look at the ones that are within the path of this hurricane and then have your table and sort by the capacity. And so you can look at, say, which power plant is at the greatest exposure of capacity within the storm of, of this field. And you could do this across retail stores. I made a map for this with Bojangles at the beginning when Florence came in. And because over 70% of their stores were exposed, that was going to be a major hit to their business. 
And so it's this type of um, insight. And I even did the same example with military bases. I used to be in the Air Force. I'm a veteran. I have good ties with several people at the Pentagon. I sent them this map, and they were very appreciative and actually invited some of our guys down to an event you know, because of it. And so these are just a few of the examples of how we want to do good for the world, some of the tools that we've built. And all those PowerPoint slides I showed you, those are real maps that are available for you if you have a terminal today. You can run Maps Go. You can access all these, a single click of a button. We've got sample maps published. You can look at an example of all the maps that I've you know, created within my own library, and you can work from there. So check it out. Let me know if you have any questions, and thank you for coming out.